Okay, so the next lot of theories that we're going to look at is attachment. So this is a really fundamental theory in developmental psychology and most of you will be aware of names like John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. These are the key theorists that you really need to know about um, if you're going to be studying an attachment and trying to apply this attachment theory to uh, understanding why people might be involved in crime. Um, if we're going to very quickly and very briefly define what attachment is, it's a lasting psychological connectedness between human beings. So that could be, uh, typically it's between parents and children, but it could be an attachment between uh, partners or between siblings or between friends. There's a lasting psychological connectedness between human beings. If we're going to put a, a specific definition on attachment. Um, and there's one key idea that I really want to get through in this video, um, and it's the internal working model. The internal working model is a, a really key idea, not just in, uh, the, in relation to crime, but in relation to attachment theory more generally. So the internal working model, if you're going to be talking about attachment in any uh, sense whatsoever, you really need to be addressing the internal working model and trying to apply that internal working model to the case that you're trying to understand, that you're trying to explain. Now what that internal working model looks like uh, di is different for, for each person, but essentially it's a cognitive framework for understanding yourself, other people, and the social world within which you and other people operate. Um, and what it does is it starts to help you to regulate your emotion, it starts to uh, help you to regulate how you interpersonally interact with other people as well. So depending on your internal working model, your kind of view of the world, that has an impact on how you interpret information, uh, how you respond, how you process emotion, how you read other people. There's a real key link here to social cognitive theory, which we'll look at in a future video. Um, but yeah, this idea of the internal working model is really key to understanding attachment theory and especially how it uh, applies to criminal behavior. So there's two key functions of attachment. The first one is clearly biological. When somebody is, or when, you, when a baby is kind of very young, they obviously can't look after themselves. They can't fend for themselves. They can't feed themselves. So that biological attachment becomes a survival mechanism. They have to have that attachment um, literally to survive. Now, as people get older and they form different forms of relationships, they have different types of attachments. Psychological uh, attachment becomes more important and this is where you get a sense of security and a, a sense of personal safety so it might be uh, less related to the fact that you need someone else to literally survive but you use other people as a form of emotional or personal safety now this is a really key idea not just in developmental psychology of attachment but in humanistic psychology so most people are aware of maslow's hierarchy of needs the bottom rungs of that uh, hierarchy are related to obviously food and shelter being a basic need but then things like connectedness and esteem and uh, belongingness and things like that so those more social needs kind of tap into uh, these ideas of psychological attachment to other people. Now I'm going to very quickly show uh, a video of uh, the strange situation experiment now this is a way that uh, developmental psychologists assess attachment styles in uh, young infants because obviously they can't fill out self-report questionnaires like adults would for when they were trying to measure people's um, attachment styles in adulthood. Um, so the strange situation experiment was developed by Mary Ainsworth uh, back in the 1960s and what it does is it looks at things like separation anxiety and reunion so what happens when your attachment figure returns after they've been away um, and these are really kind of key ideas and this is one way that people study um, attachment theory. In 1969, American psychologist Mary Ainsworth gave developmental psychology a new procedure for studying attachment in infants. She called it the strain situation classification, and it's widely referred to as simply the strange situation. As an adult, you know when you've formed an attachment with someone, you know how it feels, and you know how to express your feelings in words. However, when it comes to babies and young children, they haven't yet developed these skills, and therefore researchers must turn to more subtle techniques, such as the strange situation, which measures the security of an attachment in one to two-year-olds. A 20-minute participatory observation 
during which the researcher observes the infant's behavioural responses to a series of scenarios. Ainsworth's strange situation includes eight stages, each lasting roughly three minutes. To start with, the mother, baby and researcher are all together in the room, a small, neutrally coloured space with some toys for the baby to play with. The experimenter leaves after around a minute, and the mother and baby are alone for approximately three minutes. In this stage, researchers are watching to see whether the child is confident to explore the new environment, or whether she stays close to the mother. A stranger joins the mother and baby in the room. The researchers record the baby's response to this unfamiliar newcomer, who is left alone with the baby when the mother leaves the room. At this stage, the researchers are observing the baby's behaviour for signs of separation anxiety. Three minutes later, the mother returns and the researchers observe for the baby's reunion response. The stranger leaves the room. A few minutes more, and the mother leaves the room too, leaving the baby alone for the first time in the experiment. The next person to enter the room is the stranger. And finally, after three minutes, the mother returns and the stranger leaves. All in all, a perfectly strange situation for all involved. So, what were the researchers measuring? When the mother was in the room with the baby, they scored the infant's behaviour on four measures. Proximity and contact seeking, contact maintaining, avoidance of proximity and contact, and resistance to contact and comforting. The baby's exploratory behaviours were also recorded as she explored the environment. Ainsworth reported that infants display one of three attachment types. Securely attached infants showed distress when separated from their mother, were avoidant of the stranger when alone, but friendly in the presence of their mother, and were happy when the mother returned from outside the room. 70% of children studied fell into this category. 15% of children demonstrated an ambivalent attachment with their mother. These children showed intense distress when the mother left the room and demonstrated a significant fear of the stranger. When the mother returned to the room, ambivalent children approached the mother but rejected contact. Ainsworth reported that a final 15% had an avoidant attachment style. Such infants show no interest when the mother leaves the room and play happily with the stranger. When the mother returns, avoidant children barely seem to notice. In 1990, Maine and Solomon added that a very small percentage were inconsistent in their behaviours and defined this attachment style as disorganised. Ainsworth's caregiver sensitivity hypothesis suggests that differences in infant's attachment styles are dependent on the mother's behaviour towards the baby during a critical period of development. Okay, this slide just really reiterates the final points of, um, of the strange situation experiment, thinking about different types of attachment. Um, so this uh, table literally takes people through uh, what happens at separation, what happens in relation to strange anxiety, um, and also what happens at reunion um, in each of those three different types of um, attachment style. So uh, anxious attachment on here is the same as what ambivalent attachment was in the video. And essentially what we're looking for is uh, someone to have a, a secure attachment where they can use um, an attachment figure as a safe base for um, exploring the social world. Um, you might have some distress when that person leaves, but uh, generally speaking, you can kind of interact with other people as well. Um, you're happy when your kind of partner or when your caregiver returns. Um, that's what we're aiming for. So a lot of people um, who have an insecure attachment style, whether that is anxious or ambivalent or uh, avoidant or maybe even disorganized, tend to have more issues around kind of interpersonal communication, interpersonal interactions, emotion regulation and things like that. And that really is where we start to see more uh, delinquent behavior, whether that's uh, criminal behavior or mental ill health, for example, starting to take place. 
And again, I'm not going to go through these in any great detail. I'm sure everyone can read what's uh, on these slides, but essentially uh, secure attachment uh, or securely attached children uh, feel confident with their attachment figure. Uh, they can explore the environment. They know that their attachment figure is going to be there for them. Um, and they see that attachment figure as being responsive, available and helpful. Uh, children who are anxiously attached uh, typically will exhibit quite clingy behavior, so they won't uh, want to necessarily leave that attachment figure to explore the social environment um, because they'll be scared that that attachment figure is going to leave them. And those who are avo avoidantly attached uh, are very independent, so they tend not to um, orient themselves to specific figures, but they'll just explore the environment more generally. They'll be quite kind of standoffish, and as, as it says on the screen here, quite independent um, and they will be quite difficult to comfort when they become distressed because they don't see that caregiver or that attachment figure as being somebody that they can count on so they'll feel like they have to soothe themselves but obviously children who maybe don't have that ability yet uh, will therefore be very difficult to uh, to soothe when they are uh, upset or distressed now there was a fourth type of attachment uh, style mentioned in uh, the video that we've just shown you uh, and that was disorganized attachment now typically these people have been uh, subject to some kind of abuse or neglect um, they'll be very sensitive to criticism they'll be fearful and anxious um, they'll act out under stress they won't have any kind of self-regulation emotion regulation uh, ability so they will literally be kind of highly vigilant looking out for threats sensitive to threats as well so the slight kind of, slightest kind of inference that there might be a threat in the environment might lead them to kind of act out just to kind of mitigate that uh, potential threat in the environment. Okay now this is the internal working model and this is the really kind of key concept that I want to get through in this video. Um, the idea that the internal working model, how we view ourselves and others within the context of the social environment um, is broken down into these kind of two by two matrices. So how do we view ourselves? Is that a positive or a negative view of ourselves? And how do we view other people? Do we view them as being positive or negative or threatening or helpful, for example, might be another way of seeing those. Um, now, what we see is that people who are securely attached tend to see themselves as being quite uh, positive. So they'll have some degree of self-sufficiency, they'll have some kind of self-esteem, but they'll also see other people uh, in a positive light as well. So if they do experience issues, they can rely on other people to help them um, and this is really a, uh, a manifestation of this secure attachment so high self-esteem but also high sociability and not being scared to reach out for support when that's needed um, if someone is anxiously attached then typically what we see in uh, their internal working model is that they they have a very negative view of themselves they don't have high self-esteem they have quite low self-esteem and that's why you see this clingy behavior or this kind of attached, highly attached, anxious behavior. Um, obviously, when you couple that with a positive view of the people, of, of kind of other people being there for you and there to look after you, that's where you see this anxious attachment uh, behavioral pattern beginning to emerge. So high uh, levels of uh, sociability in terms of seeking out others for support, coupled with low levels of self-esteem typically relates to uh, anx anxious attachment. Avoidant attachment uh, typically will, uh, or those who are avoidantly attached, will typically see themselves in quite a positive light. They'll see themselves as being quite self-sufficient, have high self-esteem, but they won't uh, necessarily believe that they can rely on other people. They'll have quite low levels of sociability because they don't think they can rely on them, other people aren't there for them, other people aren't there to help them. Um, so again, couple positive view of the self, so uh, self-esteem, self-sufficiency, uh, self-reliance with a negative view of other people. This is kind of uh, not being able to rely on other people. This is where you get the independent behavioral patterns of avoidant attachment. And if you have a negative view of yourself, um, so low self-esteem, maybe through abuse or neglect, and also uh, for the same reasons, a low opinion of other people that you can't rely on them, this is where you typically see um, a disorganized attachment style. So you are constantly looking out for threats because you can't rely on other people to be there to support you and to scope out those threats on your behalf. 
but also you don't feel as though you have the requisite skills to then go and deal with those threats when you see them so that's why you see the acting out uh, and the kind of uh, preemptive strikes uh, in relation to kind of acting out behaviorally uh, and aggressively another thing that was mentioned in the video is the caregiver sensitivity hypothesis now this is another one of Ainsworth's big ideas um, looking at uh, particularly the uh, the consistency and the responsiveness of a primary caregiver so people who are securely attached typically have consistent and responsive attention from their primary caregiver um, so people know that their caregiver or their attachment figure is going to be there for them it's consistently there for them that support and the support is very responsive to their needs um, those who are less securely attached, so insecurely attached in an anxious way or an avoidant way or a disorganized way, don't have that security. So this goes back to the idea of attachment being a security uh, based issue. The responsiveness um, and attention from a primary caregiver for people who are insecurely attached is inconsistent and unresponsive. So it's not all there, always there uh, when it's needed and it's not necessarily responsive to the individual's needs. Okay, if we think about applying attachment theory to uh, a handful of different offence types, if we start with stalking, obviously the repeated attempt to curtail the freedom of another person, uh, usually by following them or watching them or otherwise kind of forcing yourself on them. Um, if we think about what that might look like from an, an, att an attachment perspective, um, it might be that the uh, person who is stalking their victim is kind of projecting a need for closeness or security onto someone who isn't consenting. Um, if we think about what that means from an attachment perspective, it could be that um, insecurely attached people who have kind of the an anxious uh, form of attachment are uh, trying to kind of demonstrate that uh, clingy behavior, that fixation on somebody else uh, because they feel as though that target is someone who can help them to kind of feel that level of security. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person does provide that level of security, but Often for people who are engaging in stalking behavior, um, it's the illusion of that security that is really driving the behavior. So insecurely anxious uh, attachment is typically associated with higher levels of stalking behavior. If we think about domestic abuse, and there's different ways that we can view this. So for example, if it's a controlling type of a situation, then that could be indicative of maybe an, an insecure anxious type of attachment. Uh, where somebody is trying to kind of maintain control, they're trying to keep that caregiver or that uh, attachment figure close to them. Uh, we do know also that an anxious type of attachment is quite prevalent both in perpetrators and victims of domestic abuse. Now that might be because the uh, victim is also kind of it, it, to some degree dependent on the abuser uh, a lot of the time. Um, so that could start to foster um, a sense of anxious attachment and clingy behavior. Um, in terms of physical violence, then uh, a lot of the time this has a root in frustration and an, an inability to uh, constructively disagree and to kind of express emotions in a way that is uh, regulated um, to a degree that is socially kind of uh, desirable. Um, and this could be a manifestation of disorganized attachment. So constantly looking for threats, being very sensitive to criticism, even if it's a perceived criticism. Um, and then acting out as a way of kind of uh, nipping that in the bud before you have to, to deal with it. So that could be a form of disorganized attachment, um, also having an effect on physical domestic abuse. Now turning specifically more to child sexual offending, which is one area that is really kind of quite popular with uh, attachment theorists in uh, forensic psychology. Um, there's been one key idea really that starts to get to the heart of attachment theory and that's the idea of emotional congruence this idea that somebody can identify on an emotional level with a potential child victim now ian mcphail and colleagues have looked at uh, emotional congruence with children um, within samples of people who have been convicted for child sexual offenses and they've identified three different models of uh, emotional con uh, emotional congruence the first one's related to blockage so it could be that people are unable for some reason to um, emotionally connect with uh, age-appropriate targets so instead they focus on children who are more easy to uh, form a relationship with or to form some kind of intimate uh, partnership with. Uh, there's also a sexual deviance model which essentially means that if somebody has a predominant 
sexual interest or sexual attraction towards children, then their romantic attractions also kind of follow in that direction. So essentially it's a projection of emotional, uh, emotionally positive traits onto the targets of um, sexual interest. And the final model is psychological immaturity. And this is essentially where people just have a general lack of emotional maturity. Um, so this is less related to um, difficulties specifically with adults, but just generally identifying more uh, with more of a childlike spirit. Now what MacPhail and colleagues have done is they've looked at the uh, relative weights or the relative uh, predictive power of each of these models when predicting emotional congruence. And what they found is that there's quite good uh, evidence for the uh, sexual deviance model. So the idea that emotional feelings follow sexual feelings, there's this projection of positive emotional traits onto the targets of uh, sexual interest. There's moderate um, support for the blockage model. So it could be that instead of uh, seeking out relationships with adults because that's difficult and it's fraught with potential conflict, some people who are engaging in child sexual abuse will just seek out relationships with children because they're easier to manage and easier to navigate. And there's quite poor um, there's quite poor evidence for a psychological immaturity model. So things like general problem solving abilities, general emotion regulation difficulties, um, very poor evidence for a relationship between those things and emotional congruence with children. Okay, so thinking about attachment theory uh, in a very general sense, it refers to a lasting and enduring psychological connection to another person or other people. You can have more than one attachment figure in your life. Um, the key idea uh, that I really want to get through in this video is the internal working model. The composition of how you view yourself and other people and how they then come together to help you regulate your emotion and regulate your interpersonal interactions. We've seen from the final slides that attachment and how it uh, is formed can lead to different types of uh, issues in relation to criminal behavior. So when you're doing reading, when you're thinking about attachment and how it applies to uh, criminal behavior, think about the features of the offense that you're considering or the, the type of behavior that you're trying to explain. How What would make sense in terms of the internal working model of that person? Is there something to do with the victim type or the victim age or the type of behavior that they're engaging in? that might give you an indication as to the types of behavior um, or the types of attachment uh, style that they have or their internal working model uh, composition.